Well, amen. Thank you, guys. Uh, they'll be back towards the end of the service with one final song for us. But welcome. Glad that you can join us for week two of our series, My Father's World, where we are just exploring what I'm called an ecology theology, just a theology of, of creation and, and how we need to accept both the right and the responsibility that God has given to us to rule something that is defined in Genesis 2.15 as being done when we protect, when we care, and when we work, we serve, we cultivate creation. Now, last week we shared how, according to Romans chapter 8, creation shares in our suffering, but also shares in the hope that we have for redemption. What that means is that we were tied to creation, we are tied to creation, and we will be tied to creation. And as a result of that foundation, we know from the Scriptures that we do not need an ecological crisis in order to care for the world. All we need is our Bible. Now, the problem in saying that, even though everything I've said is true, is that sadly we live in a day and an age where people believe that it is a mark of Christian maturity and prophetic responsibility to resist every form of creation concern. In fact, a number of people will go as far as to say that even if we raise the topic, we are sliding into liberal concerns. Now, the reason that they say that Research, research shows is because our political ideology, our ethnicity, and our race are more connected to our view of the world and our responsibility to it than our faith. Remember the Pew Research. Religious affiliation and no religious affiliation matter little when it comes to creation concerns. What actually matters more uh, the color is the color of your political party, the color of your skin, and where you were born. Now, since that is the environment into which God's Word is thrust, since that's the climate that I basically address you in, the responsibility, the ask being made of everyone that my voice reaches, both in this room and online, is actually significant. Because the reality is that all of our backgrounds, mine included, shape our thoughts about this topic and every other critical topic that this nation is addressing. And as a result of that, when we approach the Word of God to read it, the challenge is, God, through your Holy Spirit, won't you please read us? Every topic we face that is a controversial topic in this nation begins with that commitment. God, as I read your word, please read me because my background shouts more loudly all too often than your text. And I will never be an agent for Christ if that continues to be the case. And friends, the challenge in developing any theology, whether it's a theology of creation, whether it's a theology of life, whether it's a theology of race, whether it's a theology of, of uh, sexuality, whether it is even a theology of patriotism, comes back to this desire that we have to subject ourselves to a pursuit of truth and wisdom that is found in God's Word. That's where it all begins. And unless we are, as God's people, willing to subject ourselves to that pursuit, then we will be nothing but a clanging symbol when what our nation and this world needs is a voice of Scripture-driven reason. And so the first pillar of an ecology theology then is embracing our calling and our responsibility towards creation, a responsibility that is clearly defined in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. So that's the first pillar. Today we move on to pillar number two. And today's message is entitled, A Wonderful, What a Wonderful World, and it's based again in Genesis chapter 1. So the second pillar of our theology of creation is again in Genesis. Open your Bibles, Genesis chapter 1. There's one verse I want us to look at right at the end in verse 31. 
In Genesis 1.31, simple text, not so simple when it comes to its application. This is what we read, Genesis 1.31. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. That's it. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. Now, if you're a student of Genesis, or if you've read it over the last week, you'll know that six times already, before verse 31, God has appreciated His creation. It's verse 4, it's verse 10, it's verse 12, it's verse 18, it's verse 21, and it's verse 25. In all of those verses, we read, God saw what He had created on that day and saw that it was good. So what we have in these previous six summary statements is God looking at the goodness of individual items that He has created. Six times He does it. And by the time we get to verse 31, it's the seventh time. But it is subtly different because now God sees, look at it, all that He has made. Everything, not just something specific, on a specific day, but everything he has made, the totality of his creation. Now, the second thing that doesn't jump out about the significance of this verse is a subtle shift in the Hebrew language. In the previous six summary statements where God saw what he had made and saw that it was good, the word used for that in Hebrew is the word ki, K-I. God saw that. It was good. Well, by the time you get to verse 31, the word key here is substituted for the Hebrew word asher, A-S-H-E-R, asher. And the whole idea here in this word is it signifies God's enthusiasm, God's attachment, God's passion for what is created. So it's as if God is saying, God saw that It really was good. This is really good. See the difference? This is good. God looks at the individual days. This is good. But in the Hebrew, there's a subtle shift. Key's gone. Asher comes in. Wow, this is really good. The third shift here is the one we often pick up on, and it is that word, very good. This is not just really good. This is really very good. So the point being made here is that everything together expresses the brilliance of God's creation. And God isn't just pleased with it. Wow, he's really pleased with it. This really is very good. Now, this may be the first time that God looks at all of his creation and he's pleased with it, but it's really not the only time, is it? Over and over again, the scriptures declare God's delight in what he's created. As you walk through the auditorium on our screen, Psalm 9611 is there. Again, God declaring his love of all that he's created. Psalm 104 is a brilliant psalm for this. And in verse 31, we read this. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. John Piper in a commentary points out that the psalmist isn't praying for something to happen here. This may isn't wishful thinking. It's actually a bold declaration of what was true, what is true, and what will always be true. God delights in the work of his hands. We see it again many places, Habakkuk 2.14, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Scripture declares over and over and over again, God is delighted at his creation. Now, before we unpack what this means for you and me, what I want to do is I want to take a step back and I want to ask that motivational question. Why is God delighted at his creation? Now, the reason I ask that question is because motivation matters. Why we do what we do matters as much as doing what we do. 
And, and you see so much of an ecology theology applying these principles that we're going to unpack over the next few weeks are so personal that there is going to come a time when you are going to have to be motivated to do something. Now, you're either going to be motivated by positive action or you will be motivated by neg negative apathy and do absolutely nothing at all. At the heart of applying creation concerns is individual actions driven by personal choices. And at the heart of every personal choice, there's a motivation. And the motivation on an ecology theology is, why does creation matter anyway? What does any of this stuff matter anyway? So why does it matter to God? Well, there are a whole host of things that I could say, but what I want to uh, say is four things. Why does creation matter to God? Well, firstly, creation matters to God because when God looks at it, he realizes that this creation declares his glory. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Secondly, God is delighted with his creation because it declares his wisdom. By wisdom, the Lord laid the, the earth's foundations. By understanding, he set the heavens in place. Thirdly, God delights in his creation because it declares his power. With my great power and outstretched arm, I made the earth and its people and the animals that are on it, and I give it to anyone I please. That's God's power. Lastly, creation declares God's presence. I love this one from Job. But ask the animals, they'll teach you. Or the birds in the sky, and they will tell you. Or speak to the earth, and it will teach you. Or let the fish in the sea inform you. Which of all of these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? I love Proverbs 6.6. 6. It says, study the way of an ant. What? God is saying, look, you can look at even the the, the smallest, tiniest, most insignificant things. And, and when you look at the ways even of the insignificant, it will tell you that there is a far more brilliant work behind all of this. So God admires his handiwork because it declares who he is. And the closer we look at creation, the more inspired we are to ensure that the universe will never praise God alone. That line in that song, if the rocks cry out in glory, so will I. And so if the, the first pillar of that ecology theology is accepting and embracing our responsibility to rule wisely, the second pillar of our ecology theology builds on all of this, and it simply says, listen, creation has value because God deems it valuable, period. Creation is value because God deems it to be valuable. In other words, creation's value does not sit on its own majesty, but in the declaration of its goodness that is given by God himself and by God alone. God as creator of the world confers value to creation, and that conferring of value gives creation its special dignity. Creation is valuable because God values it, period. Now, what's the practical application of that? What's the principle? I think it's this. Precisely because creation is inherently valuable to God, it is intrinsically valuable to us even before it serves us any instrumental purpose. Let that sink in for a second. Because I think if we accept this principle and seek to live out this principle, not only will our relationship with creation change, but the way we treat other people will change too. Precisely because creation is inherently valuable to God, it is intrinsically valuable to us, even before it serves any instrumental purpose in our lives. Now, if you look at that statement closely, you can see that the, the, the word value here applies in three different ways. There's inherent value, 
There is intrinsic value and there is instrumental value. In order to understand our responsibility to creation, we need to discern the difference between inherent value, intrinsic value, and instrumental value. Creation is inherently valuable to God. God looked at it, and he said, wow, this really is good. Inherent value. Now, inherent value refers, quite simply, to the way value is given to something or someone by the valuing agent. Let me say that again. Inherent value refers to the way value is given to something or someone based on the judgment of the valuing agent. Creation is valuable to God, the valuing agent, because he deems it to be, wow, really very good. Now, that value has nothing to do with the material value of the earth itself. In fact, it has absolutely nothing to do with its instrumental value to us. It's valuable because God values it, period. Now, this can be a little difficult to understand. So as I was thinking about how to illustrate this, I, I thought about these. Now, these are prayers, ideas, dreams, and letters that Vipka and I shared 30 years ago, well before we were married. In here, we have letters that were written. So this one, for example, is from August the 2nd, 1992. Uh, we've kept them all. And there are many times through a year where I'll just go back and I'll have a look at this book, the things we were praying for, the ideas that we were dreaming up, the plans that we had. And it's amazing to see how God has ordained some of them and laughed at others. Do you think these are valuable to me? These are really valuable to me. Do you think these have material worth? Are they worth a lot materially? No. But they're valuable to me. And do you know why they're valuable to me? What's in here declares the glory of our love. It talks about the wisdom upon which we were aspiring as two very different people from two very different countries who spoke two very different languages, recognizing our own brokenness to be shaped by God and to be useful to Him. These are valuable to me. They're valuable. And these are valuable to me even though they are of little instrumental value to you. Sure. Do you think if I were to copy these and pass them all out to you and you would read them, do you think you would get to know me a little bit more? Yeah, of course. Would that knowledge of me help you relate to me and our relationship to deepen? Yes, it would. But the point is still true. The value I place on these letters, these dreams, these ideas exist and they have value independent of anything that you can bring to the table. These do not require you in order to be valuable. Think about Genesis 131. And God saw all that he had made and saw that it was really very good. He saw that it was inherently valuable. Now here's the point. When is Adam given his mandate with regard to creation? Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15. Before Adam was of any instrumental use to the stewardship of creation, before he was ever told to serve it, to cultivate it, to protect it, to care for it, God declares the inherent value of creation. God gave inherent value to creation before we humans ever became instrumental in its care or in its destruction. 
inherent value. Precisely because God inherently values creation, it is what? Intrinsically valuable to us. Intrinsic value. Intrinsic value is basically what happens when I recognize something to be incredibly valuable to someone whose evaluation I respect. That value that I place on something valuable to someone else exists even though the things that they value have nothing to do with what will bless or fulfill me through the rest of my life. Intrinsic value. If we trust the judgment of the valuing agent, God himself, then Christians look at God's declaration of value in creation and say precisely because God matters and creation matters to God, then creation matters to me, irrespective of whether it does anything to advance my life. These things should have value to you because they have value to me. At least that is the case if you value my evaluation. Intrinsic value. Precisely because God inherently valued creation, before he'd ever tasked us to do anything, creation is intrinsically valuable to us, quite apart from whether it will ever help us achieve our life goals. Why? Because God's evaluation matters most. The third part of this is instrumental value. Instrumental value is the value that I give to something, say a tool or an instrument, that is value to me precisely because of the purpose that it serves me. So look at this table as an example. Normally we have a, a lot smaller table. So knowing that I would need a table for these props and recognizing that the smaller table would be so clumsy to use, I asked our tech team to change the head of the table to give me a bigger one because I had need for the table. The value of this table is instrumental to me. If I didn't have these props, I wouldn't need the larger tabletop. Precisely because I needed a larger tabletop, this table is instrumentally valuable to me. Take away the need that I have, you take away the value for the table. Now with all of that in mind, think about this principle again. Why should creation matter? Why does it matter? Well, precisely because creation is inherently valuable to God, it is intrinsically valuable to me, even before it's of any instrumental worth whatsoever. This is Genesis 1.31. How on earth can a Christian read this and think that a mark of spiritual maturity is resisting creation concerns when God says this is really valuable? Let me ask you this. Does God's evaluation matter to you? If it does... Creation should matter to you. See, when we do not value what God values, we move from responsible enjoyment to irresponsible exploitation. And again, here's the principle. Exploitation begins when I fail to value what God values. Now, if you think about this, it makes perfect sense, right? And if we also think about this, we understand and accept this principle in so many other areas of life, especially when it comes to people. If you've been around in the church for long enough, not just our church, but the evangelical church in general, you'll be able to complete this sentence. It begins, lost people. What's the next part? Lost people. Lost people matter to God. Lost people matter to God. Now, why have we said that? Why have we said lost people matter to God? Because we realize that people, all people, found people, saved people, and lost people are inherently valuable to God. You know where that begins? Genesis 131. 
God saw all that he had made and declared it to be very good. Lost people matter to God because all people matter to God. And because people are inherently valuable to God, all people, then basically people, all people, including lost people, are intrinsically valuable to us. And because they're intrinsically valuable to us, that exists even when people are of no use to us. The Bible says that God's evaluations of people and things are basically based on His character, not ours. I think we can all bless God for that. See, in God's eyes, a person's value has no relationship to their wealth, nothing to do with their usefulness to us at all. And since it is the love of God that defines what is valuable, it is our love for God that should drive our response to God's evaluations. Uh, Tony Evans uh, shares how two men were out playing golf. And one man was about to make a, a chip shot onto the green. And as he was about to take his shot, a, a large funeral procession passed by. And the guy who was going to take the chip shot uh, just took off his, uh, his golf hat. He went down on his knees. He bowed his head and he just started to pray. And the other guy who was on the green looks at this and says, wow, I, I've never seen anything like this. How thoughtful, how considerate of you to, to basically take off your cap, fall down on your knees, and just pray for that person passing by. Well, the guy getting up from his knees looked at his friends and said, well, yeah, we were married for 35 years. That's the least I could do. <laughs> the point in Tony Evans' story is that it's really, really easy to put our passion, our interest for certain things above showing valuable, value to people who God deems valuable. When we do not value what God values, then essentially what we are doing is considering lesser things, lesser things, less valuable. And when we do that, we move from responsible enjoyment to irresponsible exploitation. And so one of the practical challenges of developing an ecology theology, or even a theology of race for that matter, is actually working through how our behavior impacts creation and the people God deems valuable, especially when it has no instrumental value to us at all. God values all people. And God values all of his creation. And if we value what God values, we will show value to those who God values, irrespective of whether they have any purpose in our lives or not. And if you think about it, we can look, can't we, at Scripture after Scripture after Scripture after Scripture that declares this. But by far, one of my favorites is this one. It's Psalm 113. Listen to the way that this is described here, how God's heart is captured. Who is like the Lord our God, the one who sits enthroned on high, who stoops down to look on the heavens and the earth? Well, that part we get, right? Because creation declares God's glory, God's wisdom, God's power, God's presence. The fact that God would look at this, yeah, we get that. But look how far his gaze goes. His gaze goes further. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes, with the princes of his people. He settles the childless woman in her home as a happy mother of children. And if you've ever felt worthless, used, unappreciated, devalued, you really can say these last three words, praise the Lord. Even when people don't value us, even when we are used and abused as instruments in somebody else's bigger game, Thank God that God looks down from the heavens and he doesn't simply see the glory of the earth. He sees your glory and worth too. If you think about it, how many people have shone in the Lord's work even though their beginnings were humble and even though they had no material worth or social standing to the community around them. But God called them. God anointed them. God blessed them precisely because what God values runs so deep and it surpasses every order, social order in this world. 
And you see, when the God we worship values this creation more than we are ever able to, that has to impact us. God looks at this creation, all that He has made, and declares it to be inherently valuable. And the application of this is that what God declares to be valuable, to Him has to be valuable to me as well. And so we can unpack that by saying this, if we care about what God cares about, we will care for what God cares for. And the reality is exploitation thrives when we only treat as valuable something that is value to us. Let's think about this in the context of the theology of race. One of the ways I think that we overcome the racial divide is just to embrace this principle. All people are inherently valuable to God, irrespective of their race or their ethnicity. Everyone. And I think that one of the ways to overcome the racial divide is to recognize, no matter what we think of certain organizations, when African-American brothers and sisters stand on the street and they protest, then maybe what they're asking is whether their lives are intr intrinsically valuable to white people now that their lives offer no intrinsic value, instrumental value to white people. Maybe that's what's going on. Maybe there are so many people in our nation, even in this room, who feel that they're only valuable to someone when they have worth to someone. How many of you are only pleased with yourself when you succeed, when you thrive, when you win? It's one of the biggest issues that we deal with, self-worth. Where does our self-worth come from? It comes from the fact that God looks at you and God says, wow, you really are very good. It was Mother Teresa who once said, one of the greatest diseases is to be nobody to anybody. Instrumental value thinking sadly drives so much of people's behavior. So much of our actions. And you know what? It's harmful. And I believe that honoring God begins by deeming something to be valuable that God deems valuable. And once we do that, God, I will value all people I will value all of this creation simply because you value it. Then the question becomes, how do I show value to something that has no instrumental value to me? How do I do that? How far do we go with that? You know, when it comes to creation care, this is a principle that each and every one of us needs to answer. Calvin DeWitt, I'll probably come back to this book later on in the series as well. He's written a book entitled The Environment and the Christian. And he lists seven ways in which creation is basically broken and struggling. Now, whatever you make on the policies and the science and everything else, DeWitt just points out natural ways in which creation is struggling simply as a result of Christians treating the world as instrumentally useful only. So, for example, one of those examples that he gives is that human garbage turns up on South Pacific islands far from shipping lanes. He says, look, one of the ways in which we, we don't show value for creation is in the way we deal with our trash. Now, I made a big mistake in this one time. I was a, 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 young, a young pastor. We moved to Germany, and we had a church in Germany that ate after every service. And uh, it would be, you got you to picture this, there would be a table in the middle, there would be the captain's table, and I would have to go and sit in the captain's table, and I would get to invite anybody to come and sit at my table with me. That didn't last long, I wasn't doing that. But what we used to do is we used to have a team of people that used to wash the cutlery and the, uh, and the plates. And I used to look at the time that they took to do this. And I went to them and I said, hey, Wolfgang, he was the guy who was over it. I said, Wolfgang, why are we doing it like this? Don't you realize this takes so much time to wash it? Why don't we just use plastic paper, plastic plates? If I did, 
the guy and he chewed me up. His wife was uh, from uh, the Philippines and he started telling me basically about the rubbish problem in all of these Pacific Islands. Craig, do you realize we've got a responsibility to the world? That was 20 years ago, people, and I'd never forgotten the lesson. And every day since then, I've washed my yogurt pots. Every day since then. But, but what's the point? It, the point is, how far does creation care go? If we start to believe that creation matters to God, and therefore it matters to me, irrespective of its instrumental usefulness to me, then I need to look at the way that I'm living, even in simple things. And the problem with that is, I mean, how far does this go? Are we going to have a list of 513 things that we're not allowed to do so that what should be enjoyable creation now becomes a burden, which is exactly what happened with the law? How far does this go? See, the application to this is personal for each and every one of us, but the responsibility is unequivocal. Creation matters inherently to God. Therefore, it has to matter intrinsically to us. Now, to bring this to a close, what I want to do is I want to repeat something I said last week. And that is simply this. Every single one of us here are connected to creation. We are and we will be. And one of the best ways that you and I can reclaim our responsibility towards creation is to look at it responsibly. And the closer we look at it, and hopefully you picked that up today, the more you'll see the brilliance of our Creator behind it. But more than that, the more you look at it, the more you should actually see the wonder and the value that you are. You are valuable to God inherently. And sadly, many of us don't feel valued because we only feel valuable when we do something for someone. And so for all of you who feel worthless, forgotten, overlooked, used, unappreciated, I want to encourage you to do something this week. Go for a walk in creation and look at it. Look at it. And when you look at it, not only will you see the brilliance of God, but you will also see the wonder and the amazement and the passion that God has for you. Look at this scripture, Psalm 8. I love Psalm 8. This is verses 3 through 9. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is mankind? What is humanity that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? For you have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. Do you know this is the way that God thinks of you? You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. All flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swims the path of the seas. This is God looking at you. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Friends, God delights in creation, but he also delights in you and me. And so the next time you question your worth as a person, remember that God considers you highly valuable, apart and before you have done anything. Look closely at creation, and you will see God's wonder in it. And you will also Praise Him for the way He sees you. See, giving intrinsic value to all of creation, including all people, precisely because God finds all people and all of creation inherently valuable, actually leads each and every one of us to realize the special dignity that we hold in God's eyes too. We don't need to belittle us in order to elevate creation. In truth, the both go hand in hand. God looked at all he had made and said it really was very good. And the more we consider creation, the closer we look at it, the more we can celebrate it. What we're going to do now, I've asked the, the team to come back and I'm asked them to uh, sing a song. We're going to sing a song as a, a a familiar song to, I think, probably every one of us here. It's that, it's that old hymn, How Great Thou Art.
Now, many, many of us trace the origins of that hymn to, I think it's 1958, to a Billy Graham crusade where the, the old lyrics were put to a new tune. But, but in truth, that story, the story behind the hymn goes back to a guy by the name of Carl Boberg, who was a sailor in Sweden that recently left his kind of sailing profession to become a lay minister of a local church. Boberg hadn't started there that long when one night a fierce thunderstorm came through the village. And as everybody was just waiting for the storm to pass, the wind picked up and the wind started to shake the bell so that the bells began to sound. And in that moment, Boberg realized the power of God in creation and penned a nine-verse poem. Don't worry, we're not going to sing nine verses. He penned a nine-verse poem entitled, O Great God. Boberg was he able to see the greatness of God because he looked intently at creation. Friends, as we sing this song, familiar to all of us, let's commit to looking at creation closely. Why? Because when we do it, we really can celebrate the goodness of God in it. This is a great time to live in Michigan. So do yourself a favor. Don't stay in. Get out. Look at creation and be inspired by the greatness of God, but also by the value that you have to him. Stand with me, I'm going to pray, and our team are going to lead us in this song. <clears throat> Father, we do declare your goodness, your greatness, and we can behold it when we look at the wonder of the world that we live in. And Father, I pray as we just live our life through this week that we would get out, that we would open our eyes and see all that you have made. And I pray, Father, as we look on this creation, that those words of Genesis 1, 31 would be given back to us through your Holy Spirit. And you saw all that you had made and discerned that it was really very good. May we behold the value of creation in a way that changes how we interact with creation itself, but also with the people that you've created. May we show all things and all people how valuable they are to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's